to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Goins here with Jake Lawler. Hello. I am just going to say this. I have to. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, this is going to be a great episode because we have rehearsed. We have just spent the last 45 minutes discussing the Lord of the Rings, the news, our introduction, everything, because I forgot to press the record button. So now this is take two, so you know it's going to run smoothly. We're going to hit all the marks because we just, we've just we rehearsed it so much. We're ready to go. Jake, I would like to publicly apologize to you for that mistake. <laughs> nah, you're good. But like I said, I have finally watched the Lord of the Rings movies, the trilogy after years of begging, basically since the day we met, Jake has been telling me to watch this i finally have and we're going to discuss it today there might be some mixed results some fractured friendships after this discussion some (laughs) lost listeners who who never trust me about movies again but you know that's that's the thing that's that's what happens in middle earth yes it will be a bloodbath but first um, we want to thank everyone that was gracious and kind enough to donate to uh, Black Lives Matter. It's a cause that um, is near and dear to both of our hearts and should be near and dear to everyone. Uh, like we said before, this is a moral issue, and we're so thankful for um, our listeners and our audience being able to donate $850. Uh, while we're not collecting, um, we don't have any more shirts and we're not collecting that way. I think that we will be setting up a second uh, donation uh, pretty soon here, but we just want to thank everyone so much for being so gracious and kind enough to help out. Yeah, definitely continue to continue to get involved in the movement in whatever way you can, whether that's through donations, whether that's through marching, protesting, educating yourselves, advocating for, for those that don't have as powerful of a voice. But like I mentioned, educating, one of those ways that you can do that, obviously, is through reading. There's a bunch of great resources out there, different books, different guides to help you out. But movies are another way to do that. A lot of great opportunities now available for streaming for free. Different different production companies are making some of their movies available for anyone who wants to check them out. Just Mercy, Warner Brothers has made that free to rent on every platform. Selma from Paramount Pictures is also free to rent wherever you want to get your movies. And our Johnny Sobchak, our writer that you all know from a couple episodes, he has put together a movie suggestion guide for different movies that are tackling the the topics of systemic oppression, of racism. And it's obviously Johnny is white. But this is not, this is him saying, here, I'm a white person. These are the movies that have helped me. And he just wants to be able to to give some pointers for somebody who, who might be in the same position and looking to educate themselves. And like we said, there's a lot of great resources out there. And I want to ask you, Jake, what would some of yours be that you would recommend people to start with? Well, for us, um, I guess kind of for me, I'm going to break it down really by uh, by streaming service. So the first couple I would suggest are on Amazon Prime. If you're a Prime member, I believe all of these are free, except for the last one I'm going to talk about. 
uh, I Am Not Your Negro by Raoul Peck, which finishes the uncompleted work of James Baldwin. It is a powerful and necessary um, experience, and I think that it's necessary for everyone to check it out. Um, another one is the Black Panther documentary on Amazon Prime, which is also free to rent if you're a Prime member, which is completely fascinating and illuminating. I think that it dispels a lot of myths and confirms a lot of uh, really interesting things about the Black Panther Party. Uh, another thing is the last one I'm going to say is do the right thing, which is available on prime to rent. Uh, it is Spike Lee's magnum opus. It is one of the most important films ever made. And one of the greatest films ever made. One of my favorites. Uh, it's so poignant, palpable and completely and utterly resonant uh, 30 years later, 31 years later. And it is a necessary viewing experience uh, going to Netflix I uh, believe Moonlight by Barry Jenkins is on Netflix. It is yep. brilliant and it is fascinating and it is um, almost like an ethereal experience when it comes to filmmaking and it is a necessary piece of viewing because it meditates on the black experience from a lens that we've never seen before. This came out at least on the scale that Barry Jenkins had done it. The 13th is also a Netflix documentary by Ava DuVernay, which is just brilliant. I think it is unbelievably important and it kind of confirms and dispels a lot of things about the 13th amendment and uh, the prison industrial complex that should be required viewing in schools and uh the last one i'm going to talk about the last two i'm going to talk about are on hulu and hbo respectively if beale street could talk which is another barry jenkins picture um it is beautiful and i think that it is also necessary viewing it's it's a an, an adaptation of James Baldwin's work, If Beale Street Could Talk, and James Baldwin being one of the foremost thinkers of the twenty first or the twentieth century, and Barry Jenkins being one of the foremost directors of the twenty first century. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, match made in in heaven. And the last one is Black Klansman uh, by Spike Lee, which is on HBO. And uh, I th I think a good deal of people said because this is the mo one of the most recent ones. It came out two years ago. Uh, but it is still resonant today. I think Spike Lee is always one of those filmmakers that has been ahead of its time or ahead of his time. And he continues to put out spectacular work. Yeah, I, all of those I echo. I have not seen Do the Right Thing. I know that it's one of your favorites, Jake, and it's one that I will get to now that I'm done with my nine hours in Middle Earth. But I did watch 13th the other day. Um, very very eye-opening i mean it's just heartbreaking to see you always hear about systemic oppression and this is really the the word system is in there that's what this is like seeing how it's just rigged against black people and just opening your eyes to just how much people of color really have to face how much they're up against um on top of that all the ones that you said i echo um but I'd also recommend, we mentioned Just Mercy earlier. That's a great one. Great book as well. That's for free to rent wherever you want. Blind Spotting is another good one on HBO. Very relevant to kind of police brutality, to um, just the plight of Black people in America today. That was set in 2018. So it's a, a modern interpretation. And so is The Hate You Give, which Unfortunately, I could not find it to rent anywhere or to stream for free. You have to purchase it for $15. But that is basically what we're living in right now. I mean, that's a, a young black man is killed by police, becomes national news. The There are peaceful protesters, there are rioters, basically everything we're going through right now. And this was based on a young adult novel. So it really takes the importance of young people the lead is in high school to just really see that you can do that even though you're just a teenager you can take charge and be a part of this fight and this this quest for justice to to help make change happen so i think that's one that everyone should watch but particularly younger people who are thinking about if they really have what it takes to to help make a change yeah i mean i think time and time again young people have been uh consistently the group that are the change makers and uh, we're seeing that now i mean we're seeing that uh with everything that's going on 
uh, not only in this country, but across the world. And uh, everything that Zach said about the films that he recommended, I echo as well. Um, like we said earlier, uh, it's about educating yourself. And there's a lot of great resources to be able to go about doing that. Um, I would personally start with uh, do the right thing in the 13th and then just kind of go from there. Yeah, definitely plenty of different options out there. And again, you know, reading books is also a good thing. There's plenty of different guides that you can figure that you can find that will teach you that'll show you what you need to get books of all levels. But if you want to just sit back and watch a movie, again, Johnny has put together a great guide with 12 movies, I believe, if you would like to check those out, that's on InsideFilmRoom.com. And yeah, shall we get into some some movie news and not current events news? Yeah, let's do it. So one of the big questions looming still is the fact that Tenet is at July 17th. That's something that nobody really knows. We saw the last trailer that changed from July 17th to coming to theaters so it's still up in the air it seems like there have been rumblings of a potential delay but nothing confirmed nobody really knows i just want to ask you jake would you feel comfortable going to a movie july july 17th i would be comfortable going to tenet july 17th <laughs> and that would be that would be the only movie i would be comfortable going to um, would you I would, feel comfortable going I would, to see would, trolls world tour on july uh, 17th what kind of question is that? Of course. I mean, that is probably the, the greatest film, not only of our generation, but of any generation ever. Ever. But, you know, granted, it already came out, unfortunately. I think that anyone in their right mind would have definitely braved coronavirus for Charles World Tour. But <laughs> now we have to look forward, unfortunately, to Tenet. Um, but yes, I mean, I, there are very few films that I would go see now. Just because I think it is, I think it is like way too close, but it's Christopher Nolan. So, I mean, it is we've what gotten, it is. the National Association of Theater Owners came out and said that they expect 90% of theaters to be operational by then. So they're definitely shooting for that to stay where it is and to be the movie to relaunch theaters. But I know you, when we've talked, you have said, when we talked on the last recording of this episode, <laughs> you said that you're just going to try and target like an early morning screening or something like that to, to hopefully find a theater. That's not that full. I would like to just, if these reopen and movies start coming out, I'm really banking on critic screenings to happen again so that I can get like a nice seven or eight person theater. We can all split up into different sections and really make that work because as much as I love Christopher Nolan, I'm going to have to wait it out and let, let some guinea pigs go in first before me so I can see what the effects are of sitting in a room for two and a half, three hours with a, a confined space with people. For sure. And then speaking about theaters, uh, AMC released a statement that they have substantial doubt exists about our ability to continue as a uh, going concern for a reasonable period of time, which I think is really unfortunate that the largest theater chain in the world is worried that they may not they may go out of business i mean you know i know that you're a Stubbs member uh, i'm not but you know i think that theater like going to see a movie in a theater is there's no other experience like that and to have the possibility of it dying at least from amc's um kind of iteration is something that is sad i mean because i think that uh, we should protect art. Art deserves to be protected. And film is an art form. And seeing a film in a theater is an exceptional art form. And it's something that is necessary. And it's something that is brilliant. And I know that we would be very sad to uh, see it go. Definitely. I mean, when you think about, and it doesn't matter how big your TV is at home, how great of a speaker system you have, there's just nothing that can compare with packed theater, opening night, highly anticipated movie on the big screen. Like it's a, it's the the atmosphere, the environment that you're in more so than just seeing it on a big screen. So I totally agree with that. I think that it's sad as an AMC Stubbs member, as an AMC stockholder, I'm hoping that Amazon or Apple or somebody comes in and buys them and 
rockets that stock price up and saves the movie theaters. But I mean, at the end of the day, I would say it's with the largest theater chain in the in the, the nation. I mean, I feel like it would have to just be some other theater that comes in and replaces it. You know, it's not like there's just going to be thousands of empty movie theaters that are strangely converted into like restaurants or office space or something like that. So yeah, I don't think movie theater movie theaters as a whole would go away because of this, but I really hope AMC gets to stick around because this AMC stubs is where it's at. For sure. And if AMC does come back from the brink, we would be able to see an Ari Aster movie in an AMC theater. He <laughs> just said that his new he just said that his new movie is going to be a four hour nightmare comedy and wherever it is, whichever theater it will be, I will be in the middle row on opening night. Yeah, this is Ari Aster is all you need to say, but then you throw in four hour nightmare comedy and it gets even more appealing. I mean, we've seen this guy just be the master of horror with hereditary and midsummer. So we know what he's capable of there. And now we're all just waiting to see what he does next. I mean, he's not, he's said that he has seven or eight scripts that are ready to go. It's just that first big break that he got. So he's not going to confine himself to a singular genre. He's not just going to be comfortable doing horror. He wants to prove himself. And I think that this is something that is ambitious as a four hour movie, but he's someone that's proven that he can push people to their limits, both with content and with, with length. He had a three hour director's cut of Midsummer, and people went to go see it. People loved it. So I'm very excited for this. It's not going to be in this year. He had his 18, 19 streak. Nothing in 20, hopefully maybe 2021. We'll see what happens. But I'm just ready for a new Ari Aster movie. Couldn't agree more. Shall we travel to Middle Earth? Jake, are you ready to discuss? I'm ready to be disappointed. Oh my, you know, your your reactions won't be as authentic this time. So know. You know what I'm going to say. Oh no, I will still be disappointed. <laughs> so let's do this. Like we said, I have watched... The entire trilogy now, that's what we're going to talk about here. If you're like me and hadn't seen the movies, spoiler alert, we'll break it all down. I mean, this is, we're going to start off with just some general thoughts about the trilogy as a whole, and then we'll go movie by movie to kind of touch on some minor points. It's not going to be like a plot breakdown or anything like that, but, you know, I would like to first start off by defending myself. I would like to say that I'm very disappointed in myself because, and I'm surprised because I really wanted to and expected that I would love these movies. I love Game of Thrones. That's the same vein of medieval fantasy, exploration, houses, knights in shining armor, all that stuff. I love Harry Potter. That's the dragons, the magic, everything, everything that's super similar to this. And I really enjoyed reading the book the hobbit which is obviously the world that this is in so i was familiar with parts of the the world and characters and whatnot but i just couldn't connect to this i didn't it didn't hit me in a way that some of these other mega franchises have that really connect that people connect with i can appreciate their greatness as films as far as filmmaking goes from the the scale of the of the world from the world building to the production value the costumes the actions the effects the stunts everything that goes into it those awards that it won are justified for those categories i mean just the the intricacies of everything but again i think for me i did not not like these I just didn't love them as much as everyone always talks about loving them to the point of it being like their favorite story, their favorite franchise, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Like I thought they were fine, but they are not like top tier for me, which is what I was hoping to get out of this. Uh, I can respect your opinion. I will also respectfully disagree with everything you just said, but <laughs> um it took me a while to get into Game of Thrones, uh, six tries to be exact. So maybe 
when you revisit these down the road someday, you'll come back with a kind of a warmer, um, a warmer approach and maybe you'll come away from it feeling a little bit more satisfied. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I made a list of potential factors that could have played into this. Let's hear it. I mean, first of all, not, not, not my list of issues, but lists of what could potentially have caused me to not connect with it. And I think, first of all, the fact that I watched them all like in a week, I know that you are someone who has done the full day marathon, which is incredible to me. These movies are three hours plus a piece. If you're watching the regular version, not the extended one. And I think that for me, I liked the fellowship the best, which is the first one. That's when I was getting started. I hadn't watched three movies already. So when I'm watching the second one and the third one, by that point, like I did this all within a three or four day span, which to me, I think it, it felt like an assignment, you know, because I was like, okay, well, we're podcasting on Friday. I have to get it done by then. I need to watch this one this night, this one that night. And it wasn't just like, okay, I'm sitting down and watching this because I'm, I want to, I'm enjoying it. Like it, it's my own decision, you know? Yeah. So I, I think mean, that's I, something, I think that's no, something. No, no, I could have. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can. I can understand that. I, like when I did the marathon, it was like my seventh time rewatching them. So like, you know, I had already just. Right. It, you were like enamored by then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's like, for me, it's one of the greatest worlds that I've ever seen on screen. And it's one of the greatest worlds that I love to like keep revisiting. So, but I, I would not suggest doing the marathon for anyone that is watching them the first time um, as great and as brilliant and as lovely as they all are. Uh, I do think they require some time to kind of get used to them. And I think that that's probably why I think that definitely probably contributed to why you probably didn't enjoy them as much as uh, other people do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was just the, I would say that watching anything that's like three hours plus consecutively like that, that like that, like I have to plan my day around that, you know, like, yeah. I, I would agree. I think I maybe hopefully if I choose to revisit these down the way that, I'll have a different approach. Like you said, with your Game of Thrones, I took two tries, I think, to get into Game of Thrones with the first episode. So maybe it's something like that as well. Um, hopefully that could could turn things around for me. But I think also another thing is just the fact that maybe I missed it. You know, like this is a story that you grew up with, you grew up watching and and knowing. And I mean, I've done that with Star Wars, done that with Harry Potter, done that with Percy Jackson, like plenty of other fantasy or or sci-fi whatever whatever genre you want but like this is something that's been part of you for so long part of your fandom of your your love for for pop culture and for me like i think potentially i just missed out on the wave of it and i'm late to the party and so it's not as effective not as potent with me yeah i would say that's fair because i was definitely late to game of thrones and it took me a while to kind of see the appeal so i think that's fair don't agree but i think it's fair Thank you. I'm glad you can at least acknowledge that. <laughs> so do you want to just get into some general qualms that I have, I guess, of what what might have turned me off from this as a whole before we get into the movies? Let's do it. Okay. Every great story has great characters. But, you know, for me, I just didn't connect with these characters. I know that's a that's a gasp from you. That's At least egregious. It was, the, it, it was the first time. Egregious. But I mean, I I didn't like. I'll go character by character for some of these. I first of all, I found Gollum to be the most compelling character here, out of anyone. He was my favorite character, the most intriguing, most compelling. I loved every moment he was on screen. I'm not saying at all at all by any means that. Gollum is a good guy or that, that I liked him because of that because of like his morals <laughs> but I just found him to be like the most interesting person on the screen I was thrilled when the third one opened with his origin story with the the, the backstory but I mean I thought on top of Andy Serkis's performance of being like the motion capture performance and everything I thought that that he was just the most interesting like I cared about how he acted, what he said, 
who he was. I thought of the scene in the second movie where he's having that inner monologue, the dialogue between between Smeagol and Gollum trying to decide what to do, this like split personality. I thought that was incredible. That was my favorite part of that movie. So props to Gollum. Gollum was cool. Everybody else, not so much. I think wow. that I not think so much. Holy <laughs> oh my god. Frodo, the main character, the 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 big guy, little guy, he I didn't really care for him. He didn't really do anything. He was all he did was be mean to the person that's supposed to be his best friend and trust Gollum, a creature he just met, more than him. Not a good look for Frodo. But on top of that, I just didn't find that their storyline, once they all split up, him and Sam walking to Mordor with Gollum was the least interesting of the the quests that everyone was on. So that made it hard to really like invest in him as a character and their storyline. Do you have a rebuttal? Uh, um, I I I don't know what to say. I'm I'm at a loss for words. And this is the second time hearing it. Um, <laughs> I just I, like Lord of the Rings is so character driven, like so character, and the fact that like you didn't connect with any of them except for Gollum. I think it says more about you than it does about Yeah, maybe I'm evil. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. You need to, you need to get a psyche valve. Um, See, I I thought, okay, I thought Aragorn was cool. He was cool. He was he was fun. But he wasn't like a all-time favorite character out of, like, fiction for me. He's not going to be on my top ten list or anything like that. I He was fine. But, again, I Legolas, he was cool. Cool guy, shoots some arrows. You don't like does Gimli? Some... Gimli was kind of annoying. You douche. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Like, back to Legolas. Legolas was cool. He, when I used to, when I was a kid, like my neighbors loved Lord of the Rings. We used to like go out in the backyard and play, get sticks and have swords. And they had a bow and arrow and I'd always want it because I wanted to be Legolas because he was cool. He looked cool. And even though I didn't know who he was or anything. He does a lot of cool stuff. Loved when my guy surfed down the stairs and shot all those orcs. But they didn't he didn't have much like of a character development or anything, like any kind of storyline other than just doing cool stunts and being like a, a weapon. So when he was doing that, that was cool, but I wish there could have been more with him. But I think my biggest issue comes with Gandalf. Because uh. Get, you're getting ready for this one. Uh, I think I think that my biggest issue is just that his powers. Like, this guy is like a legendary wizard. And I just had trouble understanding the extent of his abilities, of his powers. I mean, obviously, obviously the comparison is to Harry Potter when you're talking about wizards. In Harry Potter, there's a very clear-cut and precise rules for how the world works, how magic works, what you can and can't do with it, when you can use it, how you can use it, who can use it. In Lord of the Rings, we meet Gandalf. We find out that he's a legendary wizard. He's supposed to be all-powerful and whatnot. And he does some cool magic, does some like basic magic, but it's, there's no consistency to when and how effective he can be as a wizard. There are times when, like when he's the start of the second movie where he's like saving himself before he turns into the the white Gandalf. He he like obviously used some pretty hefty magic to get himself out of that. He goes back and forth with Saruman, just like headbutting each other and slinging each other around. That was pretty basic. But it seems like there are times when he could very easily use magic and does not. It's just it's just inconsistent for me. And I think that that's something that in fantasy you with each world, there are rules to how the world works. And with this, I didn't find any like not explanation. I don't need to know how he got his powers, but just, I need to know like what, how this world works. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
I don't know. I guess kind of for me, like magic at its essence is supposed to be ambiguous. It's supposed to be shout, uh, shrouded. Um, I think like explaining clear cut rules, while it may do some to kind of like alleviate some concerns or uh, answer some questions. I mean, at its heart, I think magic is something that, you know, we should just watch and consume and enjoy. And it's something that doesn't necessarily need to have an explanation because the explanation, at least from my perspective, sort of devalues the essence of what they're doing. Um, to be able to not know what's going to come next or to be able to not know what Gandalf would be able to do next is something that I always found rather exciting. But uh, I do get that it, it would be kind of confusing if he can't, like, do some things but do some other things. Uh, it's but... like I don't, I don't need to know how he got his powers or, like, how he trained or anything like that. But it's just, like, it seems – lazy to only have him be able to use his powers when it's convenient as a plot device versus like some sort of like consistent explanation of like why he can't do something you know like it it just it just seems inconsistent to me and that's what it took took away from it because i'm like okay i'm watching this and i'm like okay well why can't he just use his staff and fix this or like use his staff and take that person out because I've seen him do things that seem to be more powerful than that, but it, it that that was just like what the the impact was on me. That's fair. Uh, well, yeah, I I see your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for at least listening to me. Yeah. Um. What's, speaking what's of Gandalf, there? speaking of Gandalf, we'll hit on Saruman real quick. He. First of all, shout out Christopher Lee holding down Saruman and Count Dooku at the same time. Early 2000s fictional villain Hall of Fame. But I just had a question about this guy when he just kind of seemed to disappear. I think from my understanding, after the tree men flooded his his palace, his, his mine, they just kind of trapped him up in his tower, surrounded the tower, and he was was stuck there. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. So, again, going back to the magic, I feel like they just kind of wrote him out of this. Again, if you're making this is a movie based on a book, so he can't change that if the book is if that's what happened in the book. I don't know, but it seems to me like a powerful evil wizard would have some sort of like escape or just ability to not be stuck in his tower. So that was kind of a a bummer for me there. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole um, essence of his entrapment is that uh, it's, it's a revolution, you know, it's the revolution because the, they had been like taking out tree beards, people, and you know they ro- they kind of rose up against uh, Saruman's regime that was just using them to build um, fortresses, and it was a natural revolution. I th- I don't think that there's anything that he could have summoned, anything that he could have called that would have aided him because the world had turned on him. And um, Sauron, as we know, is not necessarily the most forgiving individuals so i'm assuming that his failure to his failure to produce results that were desired caused um sauron to turn his back on him and it doesn't necessarily matter how powerful of a wizard you are if you are going to try to like escape then it's going to be very difficult going up against an entire race of tree people i guess i guess Speaking of Sauron, though, first of all, big issue, Saruman and Sauron, can we change those letters? Like, way too, way too close. If I, if I, if I, I feel like that's something we can agree on. Yeah, name your name your bad guys different things. Oh, we can we can agree on that one for sure. Okay, at least there's one thing we can come out of this agreeing on. But I think that 
another big issue here is that to me fantasy is all about the battle of good versus evil like no matter what story you read or watch whatever whatever format you consume it in that's the ultimate defining characteristic of fantasy good versus evil and in this like obviously there's evils the eye of sauron is evil but there's no embodiment of evil other than this eye but there like the eye doesn't have any kind of characteristics or, or qualities or personification other than being evil because he's evil like there's no complexity to a character like a voldemort or a Sanister or anything like that where it's someone who you you get to know them even though like you still get to know the bad guys in fiction and it's just learning who they are what justifies their cause why they think they're right why they're doing what they're doing but with this like this guy doesn't even talk he's just an eye with the exception of that very early at the start of the first movie the kind of like setting the scene there's no further development of sauron other than being evil for the sake of being evil and wanting world domination so i think that that was something that kind of discredited that when it came to the threat of him like i was like okay well this isn't a a character that i really am invested in uh i do not agree with that i mean what like, would you say what would you say are sauron's defining characteristics then uh i mean i don't think it's necessarily about his defining characteristics i mean uh was there not enough evil for you i think that there was like no i'm saying but it's like but turn. it's like the evil it's just evil for the sake of being evil for wanting world domination versus something like uh i don't want to keep comparing this to harry potter but like with voldemort you learn about like why he became who he was like what he what led him there you learn about the horcruxes and his childhood and kind of everything that built him into being who he is and i feel like most stories you learn that about the 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 bad guy uh yeah i mean no i i think that learning about why someone ended up being bad completely devalues their ability to be fully evil. I mean, so Sauron is like the purest evil imaginable. There is no factor which switched him. There is no moment that turned him. There is no circumstance that caused him to be what he was. He is evil, pure and pure. And pure. I mean, there, there's no explanation. There's no reason. He is just the worst possible individual that anyone could ever come into contact with. He's the worst possible evil that anyone could come into contact with. And at a base level, that's what you're dealing with. If you want to talk about like the fantasy tropes, if you're talking about good versus evil, it's not like good versus conflicted, not to say that Voldemort was conflicted. I mean, Voldemort was evil for sure, but it is good versus evil at its, at its essence with Lord of the Rings. I, I mean, I, that's just something that we disagree on. Like, I think it's the most fascinating part is learning why a villain is who they are, what drove them to having the beliefs that they have and, and choosing to take the actions that they take that make them evil. I don't think that takes away from their evilness. I don't think because we learned all of Cersei Lannister's backstory makes her any less than one of the most despicable villains of all time. I don't think there's any kind of by learning about them doesn't justify their actions. It doesn't take away from their capacity for evil. And so that's just Uh, my, I just, I just wanted to, to know a little bit more about who the bad guy is, what they're fighting against other than, it's a big eye in the sky that wants to rule the world and that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's also like a clear uh, fantasy trope that it's more about, it's more about the journey than it is the destination. And, you know, Sauron is not necessarily a focal point of the story. It's more necessarily about the evil that he has created in this world that he is trying to dominate. And I mean, I think that's about as clear cut as you can be when it comes to good and evil. So, Again, 
just a different and difference in what we're looking for in a in a story. Um, my final overall qualm before we get into a little bit more specificity with the movies, um, just the fact this is going to kill you because you've said multiple times that you love the pacing here, but for me, I I don't know if this would really be considered a pacing issue or a I guess just I don't even know where it would fall, but the fact that we would go 30, sometimes 45 minutes without seeing a group of characters. Maybe I'm just dumb, but that was like, (laughs) but that was like hard to keep up with. And when you're, that's why I like the first movie the best is because everybody's together. They're all on one cohesive mission, basically before at the end, they all split up. Then in the second and third one, you've got, six seven eight different parties going on different things happening at the same time and characters that you don't really know like you just kind of like meet tons of people along the way and so it's like okay wait so who is this person we haven't seen them in 45 minutes what were they doing again oh yeah they were going here but what were they going there for because the other people were going like again maybe i'm just dumb but there was a lot of stuff to try and keep track of especially when you have gaps that are that big between checking in with different groups and it's not it's not about them being split up like i mean we talked about empire strikes back not too long ago and that's obviously one where the the core group of characters are split up in different parts and i think it's just the balance of when in lord of the rings when you've got a group that big you've got to check in at a lot of different places yeah, I mean, I I can understand that. I I have never had an issue with it. Um, how many times I've seen it, I've always thought. Try to think kind of, back to your first time. I guess. I I know that's probably years ago, but yeah, I mean, I don't there, I, like. I, obviously, if I were to watch this again and again, again and again, and be more familiar with the characters, I would be able to be like, yes, this is. I could like see a cohesive storyline going all the way through regardless of how how many times we're with them but on a first watch like it's overwhelming um i yeah i don't think it's overwhelming i think it was it was nice to kind of have a break from it was like nice to have a break from this group of characters or it's nice to have a break from this storyline or it's nice to have a break from this group of people and what their mission is i mean i thought from yeah i mean i think like thinking back i i'm still under the impression that i was um, just kind of fascinated by the exploration of everything and to be able to do it in so many facets and, you know, have breaks away from different storylines. I thought um, worked really well for me. Well, that's good for you. I'm happy that worked for you. I'm happy about that, man. I'm again, this is not, I did not dislike these movies i gave the first one four stars the second one and the third one both three and a half stars this is this is just not how much i wanted to love them as much as i was i believe i said it in the first recording that lord of the most fandoms are divided like people either love or hate something but i feel like lord of the rings for the most part is universally loved and I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be one of those people who just absolutely falls in love with this. And unfortunately I wasn't, it's just not, it wasn't like in my top tier movies or, or fandoms or anything like that. So it's not that I didn't dislike them. I just don't think that they lived up to what I was hoping they would be. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that's fair. So I guess let's kind of break it down movie by movie now. It's not going to be super in depth, I wouldn't think. But just I, I've got the notes jot that I wrote down while I was watching. Um, some some highlights. It's mostly positive, so that'll be good for you, Jake. I, I think. But just some general observations that I had while I was watching. You ready? Let's go. So starting with the Fellowship of the Ring, the first movie. First of all, I really like the opening segment, the fantasy storytelling narrator talking explaining the the history love that part love the mythology and just this the and right off the bat world building okay 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 am i just I, gonna read my list 
Yeah, well, you'll you'll read the list and we'll we'll see what you're working with. I mean, because I'm going to agree with everything that you agree with, and I'll see what you disagree with. Okay, moving on. I enjoyed the aspect that the hobbits were kind of a vessel for for us as viewers getting into this world, especially non book readers. That these guys were kind of living in the Shire and hobbits and on their own, kind of shielded in this bubble from the rest of the world. And so as they're discovering everything, we are too. We're we're exploring everything and seeing these new lands, these new creatures, magic, everything going on. And so they're the vessel for us to really see it through their eyes. That it's not like, okay, everyone in this universe knows what's happening except for the viewer. So I appreciated that. Okay, okay, okay. I thought that it's funny for me looking at these movies. These are things that that you probably didn't experience because you watched these movies in real time. But mm-hmm. for me, looking back on the people in these movies now, knowing like who I know them as versus most people, when they watch Lost, they think, oh, that's Mary talking about Dominic Monaghan. They're like, yeah. oh, that's Mary from Lord of the Rings. Meanwhile, I'm watching it and I'm like, that's Charlie from Lost. <laughs> so I just kind of like, like Sam obviously is Bob. Bob Newby from Stranger Things, or Rudy, if you want to go that route, for Samwise, Gamgee, and obviously Boromir. I'm like, oh, there's Ned Stark. Christopher Lee was Count Dooku. Mary, Charlie from Lost, Gandalf, Magneto, Aragorn. This is the best one. Aragorn was the the driver from Green Book. Yeah. <laughs> I just think that's fascinating to, depending on when, like, this is, for most of these people, this is, like, their crowning achievement. Like, obviously, Elijah Wood, regardless of having seen Lord of the Rings or not, he is Frodo. Like, that's someone that is, like, already that character, whether I've watched them or not. So, I that's not, I wasn't like, oh, that's the dude from, from Wilfred, the, the TV show. But yeah. So I think that's just funny to to look back, depending on when you watch these movies and see how people, I guess it's how people's character or careers took off after this uh, and then relating it back to where they started. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of these, some of uh, the people that we're seeing are kind of like jettison their careers. I mean, Carl Urban is a favorite of mine and uh, he's in the last two uh, films and uh, wait, is he in? Is he in two to- two towers? Which character is this? Uh, Aramir. Is that the fa- Boromir's brother? Let me look it up. I think he's just in the second one, or in no, the no. third one. I mean. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, these films really jettisoned a lot of careers. Uh, Carl Urban is one of my kind of favorite working actors. He's in the. Uh, He's in the boys. He's in the second on one and the third one, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's in, um, he's in uh, the boys on Amazon Prime, and he's in the last two half of this one. Uh, and Orlando Bloom, shout out to his agent for after these getting him right into uh, into Pirates of the uh, Caribbean. Right, right. Like obviously, I knew Orlando Bloom mainly from Pirates, but I also knew that he was Legolas. So. It's not like that. I left him off of my list because I knew him as both, even though I had been exposed to pirates. But and there's you a, talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who was uh, and he, like Hugo Weaving had one of like the craziest late '90s to uh, mid 2000s career. I mean, because he went straight from Agent Smith and the Matrix trilogy. Uh, to simultaneously playing Elrond in Lord of the Rings, and then he was in V for Vendetta, which is like one of the great performances of the 21st century. And then, don't forget, he was Red Skull in Captain yeah. America. Yeah, I mean, he's he's been a part of like the great and Trans- the voice <laughs> and the voice of Megatron in Transformers. Oh my God, dude's a money maker. <laughs> and and he was in Legends of the Guardians: The Owls of Gahul. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i mean but like what a career this guy's had so i yeah i i would say that i probably dubbed him as red skull knowing him he doesn't even look the same though as elrond so that was that wasn't like an easy identifier i want to ask you though you've mentioned that you love 
the pacing of these movies. People, even Lord of the Rings fans that I've seen doing my research, talk about the beginning of Fellowship. Like, 45 minutes or whatever, and you're still in the Shire. An hour and 33 minutes, I wrote down, when the Fellowship finally teams up. What are your thoughts on on the pacing there? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the Fellowship is my favorite one. Um I th- I think that Return of the King is probably a better movie, but uh, Fellowship has always been my favorite. I've never uh, had a problem with them taking so long to meet up. I mean, I always thought, uh, because it's like the sheer peril that Frodo goes through. I mean, like he's almost killed like <laughs> on two separate occasions. And um, it, it really t- does a great job in sort of levying the danger. And there's like the intrigue and the mystery about who Strider is. Um, and just leaving the Shire and seeing kind of the world that the bubble that they had lived in and then venturing out into this beautiful and this dangerous world with so many uh, different threats. Um, I'd never, I've never really had a problem with it. I also liked it. Surprise. You thought I was going to roast it. <laughs> no, I, again, I thought that fel- fellowship was my favorite from uh, the ones that I, the, the, the three, I think that, I'm a huge fan of world building. So I loved that slow approach of establishing everything, not rushing into anything, not, I mean, obviously you've got a three hour movie. So I think that a third of it should be justified to like the, the introduction, especially when it's the first of a three part series. So I was good with that. I was very confused. I was very confused when Gandalf died or seemingly died. Oh, I, yeah. I was like, yeah. wait, what? Yeah, that was crazy. Seemed, I remember the first time watching it. I was like, oh my God, no. <laughs> seemed pretty convincing to me. Yeah. But then, of course, he comes back. Again, closing up Fellowship, I thought that this was my favorite one. I liked having everyone together, less splitting time, jumping around between different <laughs> different groups, different parties. I think that's why I liked it the best. On top of just like first getting into everything. That's that's fellowship. You want to move on to two towers? Let's do it. First thing I wrote down, Gandalf auditioning for Mission Impossible in this opening with the oh, fire yeah. monster. <laughs> Stuntman, Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise, absolute just like skydiving, halo jump. It was pretty gnarly. Yeah, no, I mean uh that's uh, I I remember watching that the the first time. I'm like, yeah, he's back <laughs> because I was <laughs> I was so worried. Yeah, Gandalf, very very happy to see him back, just doing his his best Ethan Hunt impression. I already hit on this one. I wrote down shout out to Christopher Lee with Saruman and Dooku at the same time. I mean, all time flex for an early two thousands villain. Yeah, Tree no, Man. No Tree Man. I think that this is one of the. Most of the effects, I would say, from the early 2000s held up pretty well. But I thought Tree Man struggled a little bit. Oh, uh, What are are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think for what, like Weta, which is the the special effects company, I mean, just revolutionized filmmaking. Um, But, you know, with age, I do think that kind of things do uh, tend to trail off a bit. Um, I mean, I for the most part, this all, like, held up pretty well. And I know that I, I was reading that the budget for these like after the first one because they they filmed them all like consecutively but obviously they did all the digital effects on the first one first instead of like throughout so like after the first one was such a huge success they poured more money into the second and eventually the third one to to increase the budget and make it even better so for the most part they all hold up pretty well tree man a little rough yeah um yeah, I, no, I think that, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, granted, it was what eighteen, nineteen years ago, and it's still most of it still looks unbelievable, right, very impressive, like awe inspiring. But yeah, I mean, you know, some some stuff is the age, the age thing is going to get you. I already talked about this a little bit. The Gollum inner monologue scene, I thought that was the best, probably my favorite part of the the, the movie, where he's having that discussion between himself and Smeagol on whether he should kill Sam and Frodo. He's 
you get him like the different voices, the different camera angles. You can really see it on his face. Just the like you can tell who's who when when they're talking. And I thought that was really impressive. I liked the way they styled that. Yeah. Shouts to Gollum, best character. <laughs> oh uh, well. <laughs> what are your thoughts on Gollum? I love Gollum. I mean, I think that Andy Circus is Andy Circus should win like in a in uh, at least an Academy Achievement Award for what he's done. Um, I do think his best performance has come from the Planet of the Apes trilogy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Gollum is one of the great kind of defining characters of the early 21st century and really in fantasy. And, you know, I've, I have no problems with Andy Serkis. I think that he's a phenomenal talent and it's, it's kind of shameful that he doesn't get the credit that he deserves when it comes to acting. I agree with that. I agree with that. Shouts to Gollum. Next up on my list is the warg attack. These like hyena creature things. That was pretty sick. I thought that was very, very good action set piece where everybody's riding around. R.I.P. Aragorn. You think he's dead? Yeah. Another another jaw dropper. But okay. then of course it turns all around. What do you think that this is just a, cro- a thought crossing my mind now? What do you think that does for the stakes of this movie when you see it with? Gandalf in the first one, Aragorn in the second one, Mary in the third one, where you think he's dead too, and then he's still alive. Like these characters that see, we've talked previously about stakes and people being brought back to life, and it kind of devaluing that. What are your thoughts there with, with uh, that happening in I this would, series? I would say with with a television show like Game of Thrones, it would not make sense. And with something like the MCU or Harry Potter was spanning more than five movies, it wouldn't make sense. But when you're talking about like working within a three movie span, also it being an adaptation that kind of like forces right. your he hand can't change. He can't bit. change that. Yeah. Yeah. But even like, even if it was an original concept, I think within a three movie setting, it's, it's, it doesn't really hinder anything if this was like long form series and I would be like, yeah, but um, I don't really have a problem with it. I agree. I mean, I think that I it's just, just crossed my mind. It wasn't anything I'd written down, but it's something that you see happen a couple times here. So now moving on to, let's see, what did I have written down next? We already hit on this pretty hard, but the struggle of like people being split up, meeting people new people not really learning who they are just kind of rolling with it so that was we've we've touched on that time to get to the battle the big the big showdown i thought this was awesome i mean this was previously before the battle of winterfell had like the the record for most consecutive night shoots or whatever the whatever that title was and i think this was much better than that because we could actually see what happens yeah. Shout out Battle of Winterfell. Yeah. Um yeah, that that is like, you know, that is kind of like the the highlight of the two towers is um that whole sequence. I mean, you know, it's just something that and even like you know, for some films I think that we talk about like, you know, even even with a, a tree beard with it maybe not looking as well. But you know, I think the great thing about these is that for how old they are and like how much, uh, you know, battle sequences have advanced, how much uh, special effects have advanced. Um, Helm's Deep still looks amazing and it still is one of the great kind of cinematic battle sequences. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was all very impressive. I loved Legolas surfing down the stairs. Like I already said, there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, I liked Aragorn tossing Gimli across to the the bridge. Does does no one in this universe use moats? <laughs> I feel like that's a very simple way to help, to help things out here. Why would you do a moat with the back of a mountain? How would that even work? Because look, you saw them able to they they were able to just throw their uh throw their ladders up against the wall and everything. If you have a moat, they can't do that. Yeah, but you'd have to keep refilling the water, though. 
moats aren't just natural. They're not rivers. All moats are man-made. So I, think, you just... I think there's just a flaw in the logic here. <laughs> It's an easy, easy natural defense mechanism. We have to build aqueducts for our moat so we can Ex- protect exactly. our Exactly. The, yeah. the castle wouldn't have fallen if they had a moat. <laughs> I, I, yep, you're right. The castle would not have fallen if they had a moat. What are your thoughts on the Deus Ex Machina in this series? Because I was yeah. doing some research. The old happy and- ending. No, just like the the fact that it's like okay, our backs against the wall all the time, and then Gandalf shows up with a big army. The Eagles show up to save us. Yeah, so like it's something. I remember it, it happens in the Hobbit too, where there's the scene that where they're like, I don't remember the specifics, but they like climb up in a tree and they're being chased by these wolves or something like that, and then the Eagles magically show up then to save them as well. Like it's something that even Lord of the Rings fans have acknowledged that Tolkien uses a lot. I mean, obviously, again, this is something that's in the book, so you can't change it as a film, but just in the series as a whole, do you think there's a point where you should stop allowing that to happen? Just like miraculous saviors? I mean, I don't know, because the MCU does that routinely. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Like Captain Marvel coming in at the last second to save the day in Endgame. Like, yeah like it's everywhere but it's just like throughout the course of these movies like that happens quite i mean i think those those are like the moments of celebration you know i think that with endgame you know we were um treated to like after the year anniversary of it seeing all the theater reactions to when they all came back you know that's just what what happened here you know and those those are the moments that you're like yeah and I, I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, that either. Speaking of the Eagles, the Eagles saved them from Mordor. Why couldn't they have just dropped them off there? Uh, yeah, that's one of the great. <laughs> that's one of the great questions. There's like a whole video on it. Um, if not like it's a very very big plot hole here. Like, yeah, no, yeah, that's that's one of the that's one of the glaring questions i think that there is something about i'm not even they could regardless of whatever your argument is yeah they could at least have dropped them off closer oh yeah making them walk all the way from the shire Yeah. yeah that's that's something you can't really work around um one final thought here or actually two but on this movie the i'm not sure again this is you have to go off the source material here. I haven't read the books, but I like I I don't know if all of the books wrap up neatly, but like we know that this is a this is like a sprawling three movie story, three book story. Yeah. So, do I don't know if you know this, but like every movie wrapped up neatly in like a nice little bow. It spent I I wasn't crazy about the fact that each movie spent like 30 minutes at the end wrapping up everything, like after the climax. Like we were talking about with Hunger Games, I mean, obviously, or with Catching Fire, like obviously this is based on the source material, but that like ends on a cliffhanger, kind of goes into the next one, especially with these three movies that are coming back to back to back. Like, again, nothing you can do if the source material says, if like the source material is that same way. But just, I think that with these massive run times that things could have been tightened up a bit by not spending so much time in the denouement at the end of the movie before picking up the exact same story with a, a then 30 minute opening. Yeah. I think that's a fair criticism. Thank you. Also question. What are the two towers? I still don't know. What are the titular two towers? Um, I think it's uh, it's Sauron's tower and Sauron's tower. Okay. I wasn't positive, but just I didn't, I don't think I ever got like a specific these are the two towers. Again, maybe I'm dumb. But that's two towers. Yeah, uh Final. well here this go is ahead, what it ahead. says right here is that Hey Siri, what are the two towers? Lord of the Rings, the two towers is a two thousand and two epic <laughs> fantasy adventure. That's an Oh no, theory. it says uh so this is some sort of stack exchange, science fiction and fantasy fan chat where it says 
I guess that uh, Tolkien came up with the title under deadline pressure and later dis- expressed dissatisfaction in it. <laughs> I mean, so, I agree could, with you, buddy. I agree. I'm not the only one that thought that that, that wasn't an applicable name. So it's a Sirith, Ungal, Orthanak, Minas Tarif, Barad Dur, and Minas Morgul. Those are those are the five towers that they could be. My God. <laughs> so yes under pressure <laughs> he panicked that he wrote two towers <laughs> all right all right let's move on to this one return of the king i think i know why it's named that so i think we can handle that i already mentioned it earlier i was a big fan of the smeagol Gollum origin story opening up seeing him find the ring or his friend find the ring and then him murder the ring and then slowly turn into this terrible monster thing. Like, I thought that was awesome because Gollum's the best character. You you keep... You, are you, are you going to die on that hill? Yes. Gollum is the most compelling character in The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's facts. It's, it's, it's established canon. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, yep, keep going. Okay, I'm not sure if this is an HBO Max problem or a My TV problem or what, but I had to turn on the subtitles because literally everyone whispers and mumbles. And I don't know if it's like a sound mixing problem or if that's the right term, but like all the action is super loud. The dialogue was very quiet. I had my volume on like 80 and I still had to have the subtitles on. Is that the same issue with you? I assume you have like a DVD set or something. Um, yeah, it's sometimes it is quiet. I don't think it was necessarily as glaring as, um, with you. Cause yeah, we have the DVDs and I don't think they're as bad. Yeah. So maybe that's just an HBO max problem, but I, I had to turn on the subtitles for that, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Just a question more, more so than a, than a qualm. Yeah. Elephants. Elephants are dope. Oliphants. Are. Timothy Oliphants. Oh my God. <laughs> You're going, that you're they, going they, crazy. They were, they were pretty cool. It was also, I've got major like AT, AT vibes as they, they like wound them up to take them down. Very Hoth attack yeah. vibes. Um, Most of these already touched on legendary wizard. Gandalf doesn't have that much magic for, for that reputation. Oh, the ghost army. I was not, I didn't really, again, maybe I'm dumb. I didn't really vibe with that. I didn't really understand it. And I thought it looked bad. Yeah. Ghost uh, Army, what are your thoughts? Is the jury in or out on the Ghost Army? Yeah, I yeah. Who I've were always, they? Um, I've always kind of thought that the Ghost Army uh was strange. The Army of the Dead, also known as the men the dead men of Dunharo or Oathbreakers, were men of the White Mountains cursed to remain in Middle-earth by Isildur after they abandoned their oath to aid him in the War of the Last Alliance. That it wasn't until the Third Age of the War... absolutely nothing. It wasn't until the Third Age of the War of the Ring that Aragorn, Isildur's heir, would call upon them to fight against Sauron, fulfilling their oath and releasing them from their curse. So Isildur was the one who killed sauron the first he was time. one that cut the yeah he was the one that cut, cut his, the uh, fingers off yeah okay man jury is out on the ghost army should have <laughs> left him locked up no he had to free also, them from their curse also don't know her name because there were so many names but i loved when the woman the nice lady was like i am no man and just sliced that that dementor up oh yeah that was that was queen material right there. That was one. That was like the equivalent of the all of the female Marvel superheroes coming together. Yeah, in, no in Endgame. Um, Gollum, my guy. He's he's scrappy. He's a survivor, but I just don't understand. There's like three different times where it seems like he dies, and somehow <laughs> he's back. Somehow he's back. I'm telling you, he's he's just one of those guys that just keeps coming. I, I mean, I respect it. That's why he's the most compelling character, because he's not going to give up. He's not going to quit. Respect. Final question. 
at the end, I don't understand. Where are they going on the boat, and why are they leaving? That's another good question. Let me look it up. I think the fact that that, that as a multi-time viewer, you can't just <laughs> tell me off the top of your head. That's just that that justifies my point here. Like, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I like I I get I I don't know where they're going. I couldn't follow that. It seems to me like the old folks were getting on there because their like time was done and they're moving on. And then Frodo got on there, and I was like, well, why are you going? Are you gonna go? Are you done? Are you going to a new adventure? What's happening here? Like, Frodo leaves just... Middle Earth for the Undying Lands with Gandalf, Bilbo, Elrond, Celeborn, and Galadriel. This is considered a mystical land, home of the Valar, angelic beings, also known as the Masters of Spirits. Well, so, that yeah, sounds I mean, lovely. That sounds well, lovely. Why doesn't well, everyone go? Well, think about, well, because that's kind of like where you retire to die. I mean, and think about the the sheer utter toll that the ring took on Frodo's like that's mentally, that physically. It. I mean, he's, he, been, he's lived a hard life. Yeah. I mean, he, he aged a hundred years and however long the quest was. So he needed a break. I can respect that. I can respect that. That's, that's it, man. That's, that's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Zach, Zach hates one of the greatest trilogies of all time. Everyone. I don't hate it. I just don't love it. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, All right. He, he liked it. We, I liked it a decent amount. We'll see if I revisit it. I can now say I've done it, though. And I can't be true. judged for not having done it. So That's true. mission accomplished. Before we close things up here, we're going to play a quick little game. We don't have a ranking or anything because we don't want this to turn into a three-hour podcast like a three-hour movie or three hours and 21-minute movie. But <laughs> if, you recall, if you recall last summer when John Wick 3 came out, we did a quick little game called basically Would They Beat John Wick where we took some big bads and said who would win in a fight. So this is going to be similar. I'm playing this game to Jake. He's going to answer me. I'm going to take things. It's basically, we haven't come up with a witty name for it. So it's, for right now, it's just called this or that. So I'm going to take things from the Lord of the Rings world and match them up against other similar things from other fantasy or movie worlds that are kind of relate on the same level. And you can decide which is better. Let's hear it. So Jake does not know these. He knows one. So we'll start with that as the warm up and justify your reasoning. Some of the questions will be a little different, but first off, who would, okay, two, kind of a two-pronged approach here. Who would win in a fight, but also like who's more effective at their job? Like who would you want guarding you or in your army, orcs or stormtroopers? Because uh, the orcs well, had some serious lapses in judgment and stormtroopers aren't really known for their effectiveness. So I want to hear from you. Orcs, unequivocally, without question. They did have serious lapses in judgment, but they were much more effective at literally everything. The stormtroopers are pure garbage. And even if orcs were charging at them at a straight line, they couldn't even hit them. So, Yeah, I could see that one coming. I thought that was pretty, pretty uh, solid answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for the stormtrooper slander. <laughs> okay, okay. Next up. Gandalf or Dumbledore? Who wins in a fight? Gandalf, easy. Are you kidding me? Gandalf's taking him down. Round Gandalf one, doesn't chaos. have... That's literally nonsense. Listen, Gandalf, Gandalf, is, Gandalf, Gandalf is literally... When he turns into Gandalf the White, he's the most powerful person on the planet. Dumbledore has never been the most powerful person on the planet. What are you talking about? Facts. Sure. That's not facts. Show me one effective spell Gandalf uses. Look, the, I'm like, literally, I'm literally on the internet right now confirming. Huffington, you're on the internet. Gandalf is great. Gandalf is greater than Dumbledore. Reddit. Gandalf would beat Dumbledore in a fight. Let me tell you something. Gandalf has no magic at hey, all. Listen, Gandalf's hey, so lame. Hey, you're you're arguing with facts, okay? There's no point. There's no point in arguing with facts. Better That's wizard, not Gandalf. Facts. Gandalf. Period. Fact. Most powerful person on the planet. Dumbledore's never done that. Dumbledore 
while he, I would say he probably is more powerful. Dumbledore could um, like Gandalf. Okay, Gandalf's magic takes so long. Like yeah. Dumbledore could literally just Avada Kedavra, and he's, he's not like a wind up toy. <laughs> He he has like these long incantations and whatnot. Listen, I'm telling you right now, Gandalf is going to smoke him. And plus, Gandalf's a better leader. When the going no, gets tough, Dumbledore, according according when, when to Screen tough, Rant, Dumbledore slides. According to Screen Rant, Dumbledore has the edge in leadership. <laughs> it's on a, it's on a list. If that's what you're gonna, if you're talking about facts, Listen. hey. But what is what does the screen rant say? Who do they say come out on top? <laughs> they say Gandalf comes out on yeah, top. Yeah, there we go. But there I refuse I refuse yeah. to believe that. There we go. That's I will ask my Twitter. publications. Three different publications plus me. I'm gonna ask I'm the, the, I'm I'm gonna the, ask the Twitterverse. I'm gonna ask the Twitterverse when we hang up here. But okay, moving on. Next one. In the Orlando Bloom battle. Legolas or Will Turner? Oh who's your who, who are you recruiting <laughs> to your team? What kind of question is that? Legolas, easy. I di- I disagree. Oh my! Okay. If you're okay, if, if you're talking, <laughs> if you're talking, really, Will Turner? Okay, listen to me. L- hear me out. Okay, I'm not talking. I'm not talking. Curse of the Black Pearl, Will Turner. You give me a seasoned Will Turner. Maybe even once he becomes Davy Jones. Are you kidding me? Listen. You can't I kill really, him unless you have his heart. You'd have to go to Port Royal and get Elizabeth Swan to open up that chest. No. I, Will Turner is a legend of the seas. Um, I could not care less if Will Turner was reincarnated as Superman. There is no chance in hell. He is beating Legolas in anything. Bro, Legolas, if they're facing off in a fight, one-on-one, it doesn't you didn't matter. Say, it you, doesn't didn't matter. Say, you didn't say Davy Jones, Will Turner. I'm you explaining that Turner. now. I'm saying that Will Turner, if you take well, that's, Will that's Turner. Two different, that's two different questions, though. That's two different questions, though. Okay, Will Turner from the end of At World's End. Uh, Legolas. See, it doesn't even matter. You, they're one on one. They're one on one. He's a better warrior. Legolas is ten times better. He, he's Legolas more, he's can more shoot multiple. seventy. He's a, he's a better fighter. He's a he's he's the greatest archer ever. Will Turner doesn't even get within a mile of Legolas. Will Turner can walk smoked. directly up nose to nose with him, and it doesn't matter how many arrows Legolas puts in him. Because he's immortal unless you stab him in the heart, which is not even at the scene of the battle. Uh, and then he just slices Legolas in half. Nope. This is terrible. Nope. Okay, next, nope. next, next. I don't listen to you anymore. Next. <laughs> Ar- Aragorn versus Jon Snow. Who's a better leader? Uh, Aragorn. You're literally on the Lord of the Rings payroll. <laughs> John Snow. How much is John Peter Snow, Jackson John Snow paying forfeited you? his leadership. John Snow forfeited his leadership. She's I don't no queen. want it. She's not queen. Want I don't it. want it. He get he gives the greatest speech ever and then literally dips. Okay, so I don't want to hear anything about John Snow's leadership. Aragorn, Snow, Aragorn's John speech Snow was goes so back lame. to the Night's Watch. He goes back to the Night's Watch. That wasn't by choice. Was the, about the alternative was dying. John Snow Aragorn, for eight seasons continuously rejected his leadership. I'm not. I'm not hearing no. anything about Jon Snow being a leader. Jon you know, when they were he, when they were shouting when they were shouting King of the North, he he wasn't even happy. He did not care. He he kept wanting to give it away to everybody. Literally, Aragorn. You should lead, Aunt, uh, Arya. You should lead. Aragorn, queen. Oh my God! Please just let me talk. <laughs> Aragorn's speech was so lame before they went charging. He literally, literally said, oh, "It's not today. Today's not the day for Frodo." John John Snow has a playbook of speeches that would just absolutely demolish anything Aragorn says. And you know what? I believe it's William Shakespeare who says some something about leadership, something about leadership, and somehow yeah, leadership he, yeah. rests <laughs> upon them. 
And you know who did that? Jon Snow had it thrust upon him. He didn't go out seeking for it, but he led nonetheless. Case closed. Yeah, I'm not. Who I'm not is here. a better? Who do you want as your loyal companion? Samwise or Chewbacca? Chewbacca. Thank you. Finally. Listen, that's why I'm Finally. going on both sides of the aisle. You're, I'm going on both that's sides. That's your of first aisle. time. That's your first time. He's, I went with not, orcs. You're not agreeing with any of the Lord of the Rings stuff. I said orcs over stormtroopers. Okay, okay, okay. That's fair. Okay. What's we next? We can agree on that. Who would you want in your undead army? <laughs> the Nazgul or Dementors? Oh, Nazgul, without question. I think I would agree with that as well. Those guys Those are guys. badass. They've got dragons and horses. Yeah. They're they're okay, final one before we close out. Tree man or Groot? Uh tree one beard. on one. Tree beard, not not the whole army, just one on one. Him versus yeah. Groot. Tree beard, easily. Groot uses guns. Listen, I'm not hearing anything. You love tree beard slander. Peter Jackson is paying you. <laughs> you're on. You're on the Tolkien will. Hey. <laughs> I can't confirm or deny anything you're saying. All I know is that tree beard taking him down second round KO. This is nonsense. You are. It's it's clear to me that you were just brainwashed by Lord of the Rings. I know I know you love it. I know you love it, but you just can't. You're just antagonizing me now. I just think you're unwilling to accept the truth. The truth is that Dumbledore would kick Gandalf's ass. Oh my god. Dumbledore, Dumbledore, Dumbledore. Dumbledore got smoked, okay? <laughs> By choice, he set it up. He was willing to sacrifice himself. You talk about leadership. Hmm. Soft. Gan- Gandalf right. would have found, Gandalf would have I'm found done a way with to the, I'm done with the Lord of the Rings forever. This is <laughs> this just turned me off. This was this was a long awaited climax to uh, a series of, of discussions in in throughout inside the film room history. It finally happened, and now it's over. It is done, as Frodo would say. Thank all you all. Say, all I'm going to say is uh, Harry Potter has no Oscars and Lord of the Rings has 17. So That was literally sympathy Oscars. That was, that was before <laughs> they really established. Stuff. If, they were, if they were by the same standards in 2011, Deathly Hallows would have won a lot of Oscars too. As a, oh, thanks for making this cool, this cool franchise. <laughs> just, that's, that's nonsense. Just... Avengers Endgame would have won 12 Oscars. Whoa. <laughs> it's nonsense. I refuse to believe it. All right. I'm just Thank saying. you all for listening to this heated debate, this heated discussion. <laughs> we appreciate you tuning in. Hopefully it was everything you wanted and more, especially since it came the second time around for, for most of this podcast. We were well rehearsed. Please be sure to follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, at Inside Film Room. Hit us up on all of them. Make sure to give us a five-star review. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And be sure to come back next week where we will be breaking down The Five Bloods, the newest Spike Lee joint. Jake, I know you're pumped up for that one. We'll get to check it out early next week and have a podcast ready to go for you guys. Thank you all again for listening. Thank you all for participating in our fundraiser and we'll talk to you next time.